Good evening, and thanks so much for coming. Um, I want to welcome you to the College of Journalism and Communications and to a two-day conference dedicated to freedom of information and breaking down walls. Um, we are able to do this um, today and tomorrow thanks to the generosity of Cheryl Atkinson, one of ours, one of our alums, who has dedicated uh, some of the proceeds from her best-selling book, to this college and the cause of access. Cheryl, thank you so much. We're so grateful to you for this. We're also very grateful to the sponsors of tonight's event, as well as uh, tomorrow's conference. Thomas and LaCicero. Carol LaCicero. Holland and Knight. Chuck Tobin, where are you? Thank you very much. And our own Breckner Center for Freedom of Information. Thanks to all of you. It would be preaching to the choir to talk about the importance of freedom of information in a democratic society and the role of FOI in telling citizens what is happening in their communities and their country. Unfortunately, that choir no longer seems to include government especially at the federal level, but so often at the state and local levels as well. The walls around government information are being built stronger, higher, and at times impenetrable. The systems created to give citizens information about their government are badly broken and getting worse all the time. The sun is not shining as brightly anymore. It is serendip serendipitous but notable that this conference comes on the heels of the national FOI observance known as Sunshine Week. This year's theme was Open Government is Good Government. The focus tonight and tomorrow will be on great stories told using FOI laws, balanced by the challenges of accessing information and the stories that couldn't be told. For those who've registered for the programs tomorrow, we'll learn more about what's happening in Washington and in Florida. Florida has historically been the preeminent sunshine state in terms of open government, but lawmakers strive each year to pass exemptions that take government out of the sunshine. Before the conference closes tomorrow, we will work as a community of people concerned about improving access to discuss possible solutions and develop a plan of action. But first, you are in for a very thought-provoking evening, thanks to our dynamic speaker and a panel of FOI luminaries. I first met Cheryl Atkinson in 1997 when we were both invited to participate in the university's 50th anniversary of co-education. Even though it was my first conversation with Cheryl, i had been watching her on TV for years, starting when she was fresh out of college and working as an anchor and reporter at WTVT in Tampa. And I was city editor in Sarasota, which was in the Tampa market. My strongest memory of her, though, was her composure as she was thrust into the national spotlight in 1990 and 91 as CNN's new daytime anchor sharing the news that the U.S. and its allies had begun a military assault on Iraq in response to its invasion and annexation of Kuwait. That war, which became, became known as Desert Storm, was the first war marked by the introduction of live news broadcasts from the front lines of the battle. And CNN, with Cheryl as one of their main anchors, led the way in the national coverage, outshining all three major networks and amazing us with the reporting and video from inside Baghdad. Today, Cheryl is an award-winning investigative journalist based in Washington, D.C., and author of the New York Times bestseller entitled Stonewalled, My Fight for Truth Against the Forces of Obstruction, Intimidation, and Harassment in Obama's Washington, which she'll talk about tonight. The awards she has won throughout her career are too numerous to name, but I think it's important to highlight the Emmys she has won for three things. <clears throat> her exclusive investigations into TARP and the bank bailout, her Gunwalker Fast and Furious story, and her reporting on the business of Congress, which included an undercover investigation into fundraising by Republican freshmen. Cheryl grew up in Sarasota and began her broadcast journalism career right here as a student at WRUF-AM and WUFT-TV, student reporter, I should say. She graduated with a telecommunication degree from our college in 1982 and went to Tampa to be an anchor and reporter. She quickly started moving up in television markets, landing at CNN in 1993. 
After leaving CNN, Cheryl spent 20 years as a correspondent for CBS News before departing the network last year. As an investigative reporter at CBS, she was digging in places where few, if any, reporters were looking. Time and again, she ran into those impenetrable walls, which led her to write her book. Stonewalled has been a bestseller. It also has been the subject of mu a much partisan conjecture because it is focused on the sitting administration. Cheryl will tell you, though, that she would have written the same book were it a Republican administration shutting down access. No matter what your politics, her book strikes at a much more fundamental subject, and that is the diminishing access that Americans have to the inner workings of our government. And she tells this story courageously. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our own Cheryl Atkinson. Okay, first, smile. Everybody. Okay, that'll be on Facebook later. <laughs> I'm going to answer a couple of questions about open government and my experiences, and then I'll take questions from the audience. And then you'll have the chance, we'll bring up a panel members who are, have specialties in this area and have their own experiences. That'll be a lot of fun. We'll ask them questions, and then you'll have the chance to do the same. So we'll begin with what I think the freedom of information law is supposed to do. I mean, fundamentally, we all kind of know this law was created because we felt the need to be able to get information from federal officials on the federal level that they were not necessarily releasing when asked for. There was a dispute sometimes over what constituted public information, what we have the right to see, and there wasn't a uniform governing policy or body that said what they had to do. So the Freedom of Information Act was intended to help in cases in which federal agencies would not give you information as a requester, a member of the public or the press, you had something to point to in a process you could follow by making a freedom of information request, a FOIA request, that simply said, you have to provide this public information to me, and you ought to do it within 30 days unless there's some huge overriding compelling reason that you, sh that you think you shouldn't have to do it. And the idea was that, in general, all the work product that the government makes and all the things that federal officials and elected officials do for us is our information. We own it, not them, and that we should be able to have access to it without a lot of trouble. So in practice, that's how the FOIA law is supposed to work and what it's supposed to do. But as often happens with the federal government, the bureaucrats have figured out a way, and the politicians, to pervert the law to their benefit. So instead of be it being used to facilitate the timely release of public information, they use that same law to obstruct and delay the release of obviously public information. How do they do that? Well, in the old days, maybe you couldn't get all the information you wanted from the government, but if you asked for it, something very simple and very easy, um, a piece of paper on a report that was generated the day before, you could get that fairly quickly in many cases. Now, forget about it. No matter how easily accessible the information should be, no matter how undeniably public it, it is, press officials with the federal agencies have been instructed to send you to the end of a long queue to wait for a response which, which will take weeks, months, or even years. Remember, the response is supposed to be within 30 business days or so. But their excuse is, we have such a long queue, such a long line, how can we possibly answer your request that quickly? They're generating their own long line to create the wait so that they don't have to answer you on a timely basis, and it works to their benefit. By the time you finally get documents, if you get documents, they're often heavily redacted, full of blank pages, improper redactions that aren't explained, because when they redact information, they're supposed to explain under what exemption they think that falls, why you don't get to know that piece of information. I get blocks of information that are blacked out with no explanation. I get all kinds of material that's not properly categorized and explained. So by the time you get them, it's, I would say, almost always so long after the story that you are working on that there's no possible way you can use the information anymore, which accomplishes their goal. In one instance, uh, when I was still at CBS, a couple of months before I left, I received a FOIA response to a request that was 10 years old for something, you know, that was a story 10 years ago. And there wasn't anything of value in it, by the way, the request that I got. And everybody's got their own stories like this. There's a more recent one where um, I'm working with my attorney on several issues trying to pr pry hands 
information from the grip of the government. But I've got several lawsuits going with another group helping me as, and their attorneys against the federal government. In one case, I'm suing the FBI because they told me last summer that they had all kinds of information after denying it. We finally got to the point where they said, yes, we have one file that you're looking for with information about you because I was foying information about myself, which you can do. They said they had 2,500 pages of documents. And the letter, after telling me initially there were none, but we got to the point where at least one, in one instance, there were 2,500 pages. And they said, do you want these on a CD, which will cost $4.50, something like that, or do you want us to print them, which will be very expensive for you? You have to let us know by this date, which was coming up pretty fast. And if you don't let us know by this date, we're going to close your case. I mean, that in of itself, I think, is improper because... This isn't about a game or a technicality where they hope you miss a deadline by a day so that they don't really have to give you the information to which you're entitled, but that's kind of the game they play. And it was very close to the date because through my own, my own fault, I, I had opened the letters late. I get a lot of paperwork from FOIA requests, and when I sliced them open, I said, wow, this deadline is next week, and I want the 2,500 pages. So I called the FOIA officer at the FBI directly. And I said, don't throw away that material or don't, don't put me back at the end of the line. I want the 2,500 pages and I want it on a CD. And I'm going to send a letter. Can I email you the letter that says this? No, we don't use email. <laughs> okay, can, can I fax it to you? No, we can't take a fax. I'm like, okay, so you have to snail mail everything. Why? You know, you, you decide. But I, fail, I filled out my letter, and I said, well, you'll get the letter, and it ought to get there in time because you've got a week. But I'm just telling you, if you don't get it in time, I verbally notified you that I want this information. So I send the letter. I've called them. I never get the 2,500 pages. So time comes when if you want to file a lawsuit to get the information you're supposed to have been given, which costs money and takes time, I filed a lawsuit with the help of a group. And the FBI came back and said there, were no, there was no information, there were no pages responsive to my request. And I knew they had 2,500 because they had told me so. So this began months and months, and we're still going through this. And even under the court's lawsuit, uh, lawsuit handled in court, the other day, um, the attorney for the Department of Justice, which is the FBI is under the Department of Justice, called my attorney and just said, the FBI just says there's no information. And my attorney said, well, she's already told you all kinds of things we know you have, including her FBI background check file that you've never provided and this and that, and the 2,500 pages, which you guys put in writing that you had. And he said, oh, and uh, the attorney played the phone message for me when the guy called back and left a message. This is very helpful, said the Department of Justice lawyer. This is very helpful. Thank you. Thank you so much. My lawyer said he thinks it's just incompetence. He's handled a lot of these cases. I don't think it's incompetence. My request was clear. The record was clear. The letter was included. They know they have the documents or they ought to know. I think this is all part of the game. And the game works to their advantage. So let's say you do have the time and money to file a lawsuit, which most people don't. But you, let's say you follow through and you go through the trouble. If in the end you finally get some documents, what happens? Well, it's too late for the story in most cases because it's by now taken months or years. You get documents... Basically, it's you're counting on them sort of through the honor system that you've really gotten all the documents that you asked for, and there's no way to really know, and they don't have a great track record for providing all the documents. And then the cost. Well, the judge may decide if it's egregious enough that they have to pay you, they, the government, have to pay you, the person or the agency, back for your attorney's fees. So there's somewhat of a penalty. You know, that could be thousands of dollars. Whose money is that? That's your money. That's taxpayer dollars. So the federal agency has no incentive to avoid this process because it doesn't cost them anything. It fulfills the promise of what they wanted to do and make sure that you can't have the story. And that's the common way that FOIA is handled today, in my experience, at the federal level and federal agencies. Why do they do this? Well, what are they so afraid? I mean, they even keep a tight clamp on information that really wouldn't necessarily be terribly damaging. And why do they act this way? My theory is the federal bureaucracy, no matter whether Republicans or Democrats are in charge, for some reason, seeks to advance itself, make itself more powerful, make itself bigger and stronger. And they do that in part by controlling the flow of information. They treat information that belongs to you and me as if, it's, as if they are a corporation with confidential, privately held material that you're trying to get from them. And they talk to you like that. 
they tell you that you can't have it, they act as if they're the owner. And I think they're shocked when sometimes a journalist or a member of the public will remind them, you work for us, it's not the other way around. That material belongs to us. That material is not your secret to be held and kept. And they're not told that enough. I think the culture has really evolved to a point where they think, the bureaucracy thinks it is its own corporation, that it owns the information it corrects, collects, mm -hmm. it trades on that information, it may trade and provide it to corporations to get favor or to do things for corporations when it won't provide the same information to you, even though they're gathering the information on behalf of you. And I think this is a huge problem. So, why don't journalists, this is a question I ask myself, why don't journalists fight this more often? This gets at the heart of what I talk about in the book. There's been a changing dynamic that I've noticed, and it's been especially prevalent the past couple of years, where it seems to me as if not only does the government treat journalists like we work for them, the journalists kind of accept that. And I'm not sure why, but over the last couple of years at, at CBS News, when increasing things would be done to, against the rights of journalists to gather information, I would find colleagues and, and people that I work with accepting it. They didn't like it, and they would talk about it and complain about it, but really just sort of accept it. Well, we're not going to get that information again. You know they never give us that information. And there was really no uh, groundswell of opinion that we really ought to do something about it. Part of that is Daily Bee reporters are very busy. I mean, they have enough to do, and they've got deadlines to meet. This is a time-consuming process. It's difficult. It often nets nothing. Sometimes I just do it. I know I'm not going to get anything, but I do it because I feel like I ought to, not because I think I'm going to get material in the end. So that's, those are some of the reasons, but I also just think the government has effectively placed journalists in many cases in a subordinate position, and we are not subordinate. And I don't claim or think that we have the same level of respect as the office of the president, and I'm not saying that, but we have an equal right to the information collected by the government. We have a great right to that. That belongs to us, and we're not treated that way. Um, one reporter, we, a network reporter who left and retired and told some stories of her own, said that she had been called in by the president um, who had complained about some coverage you know, that the press had been doing. He didn't like it. And instead of, in my view, sort of getting back at, I don't know how the meeting went, but it didn't sound like they pushed back. And my, my response would be, if someone were to look at me and say he didn't like how we did certain news coverage, I would say, well, we're not here to do that to please you, sir. We're here to do what we think is right for the public opinion. But reporters get really nervous and frightened when the White House starts calling and pushing back about their stories, or maybe their bosses get nervous. And if your bosses aren't going to stand behind you on your reporting, I think we all know there's hardly any point in doing it because it's, it's just going to hang out there by itself. So those are the things that make it difficult to push back against this lack of transparency. Um, one more story I wanted to tell about that, the, where we didn't get together when I think we could have. When healthcare.gov was launched, and um, to this day we still don't have the most basic public documents to back up claims by the administration, which we know have been proven, claims they made under oath before Congress, and things they provided to the public have been proven false. And yet now we have to rely almost solely on just what they say because they won't provide any documents. And I have a lawsuit pending for material on that uh, that's, getting, that's growing old. But um, at some point, it, you guys remember when the launch was such a disaster, they tried to put in a bunch of fixes. And they started what they called sort of a war room, and they hired people to bring in to make that website work, which was one of the healthcare.gov problems. And CBS came to me because I was covering some of that story, and they said, See if we can get a camera in just to have pictures of this war room that they keep talking about to see what they're doing and how they're troubleshooting the problems and who's working there. So I called Health and Human Services, which is the federal agency in charge, and I said, we'd like to just get a camera in there and just shoot some pictures for a few minutes and see what's going on in the war room. And, and of course, like I expected, she said, no, you won't be allowed to do that. You know, the people are very busy, they're working, they can't be interrupted, and we won't be letting you have a camera in there. So within a week or so, I interviewed a corporate official for a story that I was doing. And the corporate official was an IT expert who had been very critical of the rollout of the website of, of healthcare.gov. And he said it was really one of the worst disasters he'd ever seen. So as I interview him, 
I said, well, you know, what is it you think that's wrong with the site? What do they do wrong? And he says, I think they've got all the top people working on this, and they're going to solve that problem. And I said, oh, okay. I asked him another question. He says, they've got the best and the brightest on this problem, and they're going to fix it. I think they're on the right track. It was so contrary to everything he'd said before in interviews and when I'd seen him. And I said, has something changed since you were interviewed last? Which is fine. Obviously, I wanted his current view, and we use that on the air. But I wondered what had changed. And he said, oh, well, the White House invited a bunch of us IT experts to come and go look at the war room. So he and some, some private corporate IT experts had been invited, whereas the public and the press were kept out. Handpicked officials were invited to the White House where they went into the Situation Room and got a briefing by top Obama officials. Then they took a bus out to the war room and got to spend a bunch of time there because the administration wanted to spin these people and show them the positive side to show to people who couldn't ask tough questions like reporters supposedly would and should, to show it to people that would hopefully have a good viewpoint of it and then go spread the word, and they did. So when I found this out, I called HHS, Health and Human Services, back. And I said, you know, it's entirely inappropriate for you to keep the public and the press out of this publicly funded facility that's fixing a public problem that's costing public money, and then to invite hand-picked corporate officials to come and see the same thing when you've told us no. So I'd like to get that camera in there. And she said no. So this is sort of the attitude that the government has these days, and I think it's really problematic. So I came back to, um, reported back to my bureau chief, and we talked about, but never did anything about it, getting the other bureau chiefs together, because with pressure from a group, journalists could change things. If at every news conference they had, we raised this and asked the question or demanded our right to enter a public, publicly funded facilities, they would eventually capitulate. They would, they would answer it. But if it's just one person doing it, if it's somebody that they can kind of ignore because most of the press isn't going to do anything about it, you can't get anywhere. So we, we talked about writing letters, getting maybe the bureau chiefs together, which I felt should be done, and pushing back on this because there were many other issues, and it just was never done. There's just not the appetite to do that kind of work, and I think it's very important work that all of us should think about doing. The young journalists today who go out into the world and cover these stories, and when you're stonewalled, it's really important, I think, and probably because you came from the University of Florida, you know this already, to push back and not just say it's okay when someone doesn't give you information that is public in nature. You shouldn't be afraid to fight back an email and make your case and explain why why this is what it is, and that it may be reported that they're withholding the information if they won't give it up. Sometimes that helps a little bit, but we should be taking steps to not just let it become the reality that nobody challenges. All right. Um, incompetence or willfulness? This is my last question, and then I'm going to take questions. This is my last question I'm asking myself, and then I'll take <coughs> questions from you guys in the audience. I've heard a lot of people kind of theorize this is incompetence on the government's part, as I said earlier. But I really think there's a willfulness on the part of, of officials. And part of the reason I think that is FOIA officers, the ones that process the requests and go through the information, I think some of them do a great job because they will call me sometimes within those 30 days and they'll tell me that they've identified documents responsive to my request. And even though I've been disappointed so many times before, I always get a little flutter, like maybe I'll really get a document sometime, you know, this time, because the FOIA officer's calling me and she says, I've identified records and I try to pin them down. Well, how many? And then I start saying, when will I get them? And it invariably leads to the officer saying, it has to go through the approval process. And this is something that didn't exist years ago, or maybe it exist, existed in a patchwork form, but now it's, I think in every request I make, it happens where it goes through a political process. In other words, once the FOIA officer identifies the information, it goes to politicians and elected officials who get to look at it and review it and decide if there's a reason to keep that from you. And 100% of the time that's happened, I've never gotten a document afterwards. And I've argued with the FOIA officer, that's not part of FOIA law. FOIA law does not call for you to identify responsive documents and then send it to a political person to approve. That's not, and I'm kind of preaching to the choir. They don't exactly say, yes, you're right, I agree, but I, I he, feel like I hear in their voices that they do agree with that, but there's really nothing they can do if their FOIA officers and their bosses are telling them what to do. If you look up online, um, 
there's a couple of stories, if you want to read more about this, with specific examples from FOIA officers telling tales from the trenches. And you can find it on my website. Maybe I'll repost them at the top of my website, CherylAxon.com, so that you can link to and read those. But some of these battles have been going on for years. There's an account from a FOIA officer from the Department of Labor who worked in the late 90s producing information on various investigations that were being done about the Department of Labor or Commerce, one or the other. But she, she basically was told for the first time as they were identifying documents in a work session for congressional subpoenas, freedom of information requests, and lawsuits. She was told, well, these, these documents have to go to Cheryl Mills. Cheryl Mills. And she said, I didn't know who the Cheryl Mills was. Cheryl Mills was president's counsel at the White House. And she was just stunned because she had not been told in all her years before as a government FOIA officer that material had to go to the White House for approval. And she says, she tells this account that material would come back with things scratched out um, or that documents were not to be turned over as, uh, as per Cheryl Mills, this political person who was working in the White House. So there are other stories like that you can read on the White House. Cheryl Mills, some of you may know, then later became Hillary Clinton's chief of staff and was named as being a person who a deputy assistant secretary of state who worked under Hillary Clinton claims that he saw at a document sorting session when documents were supposed to be turned over for Benghazi for the investigations, this deputy assistant secretary of state says he walked into the room and, and was told by someone who was working there that we're sorting out embarrassing documents that could prove embarrassing to the secretary of state or her staff on the seventh floor. And he also claims that Cheryl Mills came in and checked on the operation as well as uh, Jake Sullivan, another assistant for Hillary Clinton. So these problems have big ramifications. It's not just the denial of a simple FOIA request. It's part of a pattern in which government officials, in my view, try to control the whole flow of information and the narrative and what we see. And if we don't do something about it, all you're going to see on the news, and it's starting to get that way a little bit, all you're going to see on the news is the stuff that powers that be want you to see not the stuff that we were taught at the University of Florida to look at. We were taught when you get a press release or there's a press conference, that's all well and good, but that's not necessarily news. You have to dig past that. You have to find out what is newsworthy, not just report what you're told as if you're Soviet television. Um, and too often now we're just taking what's given to us. We can't get our hands on the real documents. We don't know where the real information is because the information flow is very controlled. And that's why I think this is so important. So I'm um, happy to take some questions if you want to come to the, I think this microphone, is there a microphone? We can put one there. Yeah, okay. I'm not very educated on this issue, but I want to know if you would be kind enough to comment. Is this a new precedent that Hillary Clinton has started? server in their own private residence, or is this something that's been done by other people as well? That's a good question. Everybody here? Um, he asked, is the Hillary Clinton private server unique, or have other people done it? And I don't think we have any way to know. Um, it seems as though, just from what we've been reading, the private server in her residence is unique, but it is not unique for federal officials to go to great lengths to get around having to turn over documents or respond, even though they don't turn over much FOIA material, they're always thinking about how not to if they're doing something they don't want you to discover. So what have they done in the past that we know about? We know that they've used aliases. They use other names so that if someone is forced to search the record under a FOIA request or a lawsuit or a congressional subpoena and you're using keyword searches or doing certain things, the alias they use may not show up. Um, we also know they use text messages sometimes because I, when I FOIA documents, I ask for text messages as well, as well, never gotten one. I don't think they know how to do it. I don't think they've ever, I won't say ever, they don't frequently respond with text mess, message documents. So I, I'm pretty sure they use that. Um, when this thing happened with Hillary Clinton, I looked back at some fast and furious documents that had been produced by the Attorney General Eric Holder's office. And I wondered why, sort of a long story, but these documents should have been produced years ago. 
the president, who says he had nothing to do with Fast and Furious, withheld these documents under executive order, once it, under executive privilege, once it came down to them having to be turned over. So they were improperly withheld for a couple of years until a group filed a lawsuit, and under the court order, or under the threat of lawsuit, thousands of documents were released, thousands were still withheld. Among those that were released, from what I've seen so far, I haven't gone through all the thousands, there was no justification for withholding them in the first place. In some cases, documents that were withheld were simply letters that had been already been made public from Congress to the Department of Justice. How does that qualify for something that's too secretive to, you know, something that had already been previously published, how is that too secretive? But something else in these documents that were produced, in the email address line, when something would go to the Attorney General, they blacked it out. Nobody else's was. And these weren't email addresses. They were monikers. So it would have just said Holder, comma, Eric. You know, it wasn't his private information. It was just the names of the people. Like, why did they cross out his name and then they typed it in again as if we have redacted this material, but here's what it basically said. <coughs> now I'm thinking, okay, the pieces are coming together. Maybe what's under that scratched out mark in light of the Hillary Clinton stuff is he's used another name or he's used another server. It's not a .gov website. So... I posed the question to the Department of Justice. Do you think they answered me? No. Um, but they did answer when the, after I posed the question, a member of a, friend, a press that is much more friendly to the Obama administration posed the question to the Department of Justice and was told that, that the Attorney General has used three aliases, um, wouldn't say what they are, but said that all of them are .gov accounts. But I think, I thought that was interesting. So I had also asked them, in addition to the aliases, did he ever use private emails or a private server or somebody else's account to send messages, something like that? They still haven't answered that question. So I don't think we know if this is the first and only time this has happened, back to your question, but it's certainly not the first and only time federal officials have been trying to figure out ways to avoid being responsive to laws. And um, I haven't published this story yet, but I'm working on a story in which uh, an official has said that he's been explicitly told, and this is not the first time I've heard this, don't communicate, stop sending these emails, don't communicate on email, call me, because they don't want a record made of certain conversations about things they think could be controversial and exposed in the future. It's a good question, thank you. Um, certainly this is not the administration that invented these tactics. And I've only covered three, Clinton, Bush, and Obama. And I've had trouble with all three of them. And Again, it's kind of naive, but after Clinton, when Bush came in, I and I'm sure other people in the press thought, okay, well, things will be changed. They'll wipe people out. New people will come in. We'll have a fresh start. No, it was terrible. It was, it was worse. And then, but this is, this is the worst part. Bush leaves and Obama comes in, and on his first day in office, what does he say? Who knows what he said about transparency? Yeah. On the first day, he says, not only am I going to be the most transparent administration out there, but I am instructing all the federal agencies to fix that FOIA problem, and they are to provide documents to public people when they request it in the press, and err on the side of disclosure, which is really what's supposed to happen, and quit holding things back. And they have to have a really, really good reason if they withhold stuff from now on. Nothing changed, and it became worse, if anything, in my experience. I think that's what's so disappointing. Wherever you sit politically, when you hear a president say that, you think, this could be good for us as journalists, not, you know, doesn't mean you support or against anyone in particular, but you like the idea that you may be provided with more tools to do your job. Um, is this the worst? Yes, I think that there's a consensus. It's not me saying so, but there have been reporters from New York Times, Washington Post, every network, um, USA Today, you name it. They've signed on to letters. They've spoken publicly. They've talked about it at conferences. We have written letters to the White House, the White House Correspondents Association, the Photographers Association. Um, one photographer likened the, some of the policies of this White House to uh, the Soviet news agency Pravda. They said that's how bad some of the policies were. Um, the problem is we're squeaking about it amongst ourselves, but we're not treating it like the news story that I think it is, with some exceptions. You're going to get to hear from Ted Brightis from AP, who is treating this like a news story. But in general, I think this should be on the news constantly. You should be seeing this on the evening news, and we should be putting pressure on the forces that are keeping information secret to try to make them release it. Um, that's my view. No, this administration didn't invent it. Oh, one more thing. I think it just gets progressively worse, and I've talked to colleagues about this, as long as we don't fix it. 
and every administration picks up where the last one left off. And the next one, I don't care whether they're Democrat or Republican, if we don't do something about it, they're going to take where we are now and they're going to clamp down even more, I think. Yes? Hi. Um, I just wanted to know um, what would be the call to action? What would you say to a room full of aspiring journalists, rising journalists and students um, who are learning about this issue and who are going to live in a world where this issue uh, continues? Um, what can we do now as students um, to advocate for this issue? Well, thank you. You're lucky that a lot of you are going to go into local news at least first. You have more luck, I think, at least I d did and do, petitioning a local agency under freedom of information rules. For example, when CDC was exaggerating swine flu stats, you all thought there was a swine flu epidemic? You'd be very, you should look up my swine flu story. When I asked them for the actual stats and lab results and CDC would not provide them, why, you ask, I went to each of 50 states. I'm trying to think how I can get around the federal obfuscation. And one by one, I got the lab data from all 50 states and a few about half of them would say I don't know if we're going to give that to you and I would say yes you're going to give that to me that's my information so I was able to get it with the help of an intern um, all 50 states data which showed that almost all of what they called swine swine flu was not only not swine flu it wasn't any sort of flu it was another sort of upper respiratory infection but long long way of saying when you go out into local and state news you should use these tools and you should have a whole folder in your computer that's just full of FOIA requests that are pending that you're following up with on, on any story. If you want to be a little better than the next reporter who doesn't think to do this stuff, you cover a story with some unanswered questions and you file a FOIA request. And you might just luck into a really big story in a week or two if you follow up on that. And I think it's just a matter of going out there with the attitude like I try to have that so many don't that they work for us. And I don't mean we order them around, we're rude to them. I just mean we hold them accountable. And that seems to be lacking in a lot of areas today. And, and yet I really don't think anyone took her speech seriously. I believe if you're talking about, she, she was speaking at, she was invited to speak at an awards dinner, some sort of awards dinner for journalists. I think if this is what you're talking about, she did give a speech and she kind of said what needs to happen for the better future and transparency and so on. Um, that's one of those things, when you go to these Washington dinners, everybody's polite, you wouldn't, it's, it's a really difficult position to be in. They invite the politicians you cover, sit side by side with the reporters who go to the dinners, and they get up and joke and make fun of themselves, and you laugh and you clap for them, and you don't want to be rude. It's just very strange, the socialization, the socializing aspect of something that people that you're also covering. So I think there's a little bit of an element of that. But I do think some in the, I think at the ground level, most reporters want to do a great job. And day in and day out, reporters and producers are offering great original stories to their bosses. It's sometimes that managerial letter, level, there's a roadblock and they don't want those stories or they don't want you to treat the politician that way because they're afraid they'll lose access, because there are explicit threats of loss of access from the Obama administration. I'm quite sure it happened under Bush, where if you cover certain stories, or do things that they don't like, they say things, and I know three network executives have told me this about Obama, they'll say you won't get the next interview for your morning show with some federal official that they're going to put out because you're, you're doing this line of reporting. I don't think we should care about that. What they're trying to give you with that access is they're trying to get their propaganda put out. It's something you shouldn't even want, but they've managed to hold it out as, as sort of a carrot on a stick that you'll get this. Um, a story that I told in the book was about uh, C-SPAN. I mean, how, how much more innocuous can you get than C-SPAN? They're very fair. They are just a lot of raw news conferences and hearings and so on. And there's a story about what happened to them when they dared to cross the Obama administration, which really does bully and intimidate journalists. They did an interview, Brian Lamb of C-SPAN did an interview with President Obama in the Oval Office after he'd been in office about a year. And it was just a pleasant interview that was going to be inserted into a presidential documentary that had already been produced with other presidents in it, and Obama was going to be added. And it was a short interview, and Brian Lamb was saying things like, oh, I noticed you haven't redecorated the Oval Office. 
And the president said, well, and he implied in his answer, the reason we haven't redecorated is in the spirit of austerity because of the country's economic situation. So a couple of days later, C-SPAN gets a phone call from someone at the White House who says, okay, in a couple of days, you're going to see a story in the Washington Post about the multi-million dollar renovation of the White House Oval Office. And when you see that, we don't want you running that interview that you have where the president implied, you know, maybe we weren't going to do such a thing. And C-SPAN felt, I'm going to say C-SPAN, I'm talking about officials there, that had put them in a terrible position because clearly a couple days before they knew they were going to do this for whatever reason the president didn't say so. And it kind of made him look like he either wasn't in the know or that he had given bad information. And C-SPAN's thinking, well, that's really not our problem. And quite frankly, if this comes, becomes news, we have to publish this ahead of the documentary. We have to publish this newsworthy section of interview because if we didn't, how honest would we be and how much sense would that make in a few weeks in the documentary to have this interview in there which contradicts the new plan? So the White House said, well, we really don't want you to do that. So C-SPAN took the issue to their board. They have a board of directors and they discussed it. And it was agreed upon, we have to publish this. If that becomes news, I mean, there's really no question about it. So they told the White House they were going to do it, and the White House wasn't happy. So a couple of days later, because the White House plants stories, this is my view, plants stories with media when it wants something to be out a certain way. So as predicted, the White House has their story in a couple of days about the White House Oval Office renovation. And C-SPAN publishes its little interview Let's face it, we didn't notice. You, you did, I never heard of that. You guys didn't hear that. It wasn't that big a deal. But the White House was apparently livid. And I think maybe it was a night or so later, the president's on television giving a live address to the nation about withdrawal of troops from Iraq when someone from C-SPAN hears from someone in the White House. And he's thinking, they're calling me in the middle of a live speech from the president. Aren't they busy with something else? And the person contacted C-SPAN to say, Basically, we're really mad at you for what you did and don't expect any more cooperation from us. And they followed that up with email traffic. They called other, they emailed and called other people and spoke to other people at C-SPAN to let them know how unhappy they were and said something like, lesson learned, as if, you know, okay, we're never going to work with you again. And since that day, C-SPAN has not gotten, unless something changed in the last day or two, an interview with the president, the first lady, or any top officials. And that's been several years. And if you ask C-SPAN... Do you think that's retaliation? Um, they just say they can only tell you that they haven't had that kind of a dry spell with an administration since the 1970s when they started. And this is how this is how journalists are treated. And this oh, one more thing: the White House said to C-SPAN, "No other media outlet would have done what you did to us." <laughs> and they're right. They're right. I think if if the president of the White House had called certain other outlets and said, we don't want you to publish this for these reasons. A lot of them would have just said, okay. So I'm proud of C-SPAN for that. Okay, that's all the time we have for this part. We're going to do a very brief transition. Please don't go because our panelists are going to come up and you're going to get, please don't go. <laughs> oh, no, go if you have to go. This is a good time to go if you have to go, but this is going to be a really good panel. We have a short transition.